Virgil Labrador, I'm editor-in-chief of uh, Satellite Markets and Research and uh, SatelliteMarkets.com, which has been following uh, industry trends and opportunities. Uh, and today, the uh, topic uh, assigned to us is called How Neutral is the Net? But we're, this is not going to be a regulatory or a uh, uh, legal uh, session. Uh, it's an important issue. We will be discussing it, and, uh, but mainly we will be discussing it from uh, different perspectives and uh, its implications on the uh, content management and delivery business. And for this, uh, today we have a very august uh, panel uh, which represents different segments of the industry. We have uh, Stephen Corda, who is the uh, Vice President for Market Development for uh, SES uh, World Skies. SES is uh, one of the major sa global satellite operators. And then we have, uh, he'll be providing the perspective from the satellite operator's perspective. And then after that, we will have uh, Vern Smith. He's the Senior Vice President of Business Development and, uh, and uh, GM of uh, VIP TV, which is owned by EchoStar. And uh, EchoStar has been in the news, and we'll discuss that a little bit, and he'll also talk about that. And finally, we have uh, Charlie Good, uh, who is the CTO and co-founder of Wowza Networks, which is a software streaming uh, company, streaming service. So he provides a software perspective. So just to give a, a brief uh, summary of what net neutrality is, uh, net neutrality basically means uh, that uh, the internet should move impartially without regard to content, destination, or source. That means it, you can't discriminate based on where it's coming from, what, it's, what it contains, or where it's going, or how fast or how slow you, uh, you want to put that. Now, we will discuss in this session the implications of that in the content delivery business. So uh, Steve will touch on that from the satellite uh, operator's perspective. But more importantly, this session is really about the new media landscape, since uh, most of the, the traffic is now going IP, and uh, the, media, the delivery systems is changing. So that's what we're going to be talking about, and uh, we'd like to encourage you to uh, participate in this, ask questions. We'll have each speaker speak for 10 minutes, uh, and then after that, we'll have a, a question and answer and discussion. So we'll start with uh, Steve uh, Corda. Do we? Randall? Hey, Great, Steve. thank you, Virgil. Um, so those of you who don't know too much about SES, we are a traditional uh, player in, in the end-to-end uh, -end, uh, media value chain. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about who we are and the global reach that the traditional distribution networks give um, all, all media today. And then I'm going to go into where we see some of the changes happening in the future and, and what they will mean to us. So just again, a little bit of background, SES, we're one of the largest providers of media throughout the world. We uh, distribute content over 44 satellites covering virtually all of the population in the world. Um, in terms of reach and, and number of households, over almost 300 million. Virtually every TV household in the United States gets some programming from SES and satellites in one way or another. Um, lots of, in terms of hours of programming, hundreds of thousands of hours. And in terms of uh, the number of services or, or the uh, unique uh, channels that we have on at any given time, it's up to 5,000 or so with a lot of uh, unique HD programming. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few slides. A uh, busy year for us coming up this year. We have uh, seven satellites that we're going to be launching. 13 are in production. We'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. And one of the things that I'd like to say about satellite that um, I think often is overlooked is that it is probably the most reliable way to distribute media content in the world. It's been, it's been here for decades, and what I hope to uh, prove to you today is that it's going to be here for, for decades to come. Next slide, please. So just a little visual on, on uh, SES's fleet. Um, you can see the 44 satellites spread throughout the world, and our offices in, um, in our corporate office in Luxembourg, as well as uh, regional head offices in both Princeton and in The Hague. Um, now, one of the interesting things, I think, as you look at this slide is you see the concentration of our satellites over the developed markets of North America and uh, Latin America as well as Europe. And we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of our media, of course, is carried over the satellites in those regions. And then also you can see the growth that we have in, in the emerging media markets of Asia, Latin America, Middle East, and Africa. Okay, next slide. So how do we do it? What are we carrying? Virtually any type of media that gets distributed to a TV household goes over our satellites in a number of different ways. Uh, most of you are familiar with cable distribution. That's pretty much the mainstay of the business. This is where we take content from the programmers and we distribute it out to the cable head ends or the telco head ends. 
The other um, way that we distribute content is through redistribution, and a lot of you might be familiar with Comcast's Head End in the Sky service. This is a way that the content is pre-programmed, pre-packaged into a multiplex send out to smaller cable head ends so that can be efficiently put into that architecture. Of course, we, uh, we provide content over satellites for direct-to-home. In fact, my, my uh, partner here uh, to my left is one of our major customers in this regard. And, um, and then we also are a very, very big player in occasional um, and full-time contribution services. Uh, broadcast, uh, if you're watching any of the major networks, that content has come over our satellites to either the affiliates or the head ends of, of each of the broadcasters. And so, again, we touch content in, in many different ways. And in, in some cases, con the same piece of content may go four times over our satellite before it gets to the end user, whether it's coming from a contribution from a satellite news gathering event to perhaps NBC New York, who then distributes over satellite out to its affiliates, then it's redistributed over a cable system to, to, uh, to the end user. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I'd like to make sure that um, I do leave with everybody is that you know, we are right in the middle of, of the value chain. And I believe that um, when you look at mass market delivery, satellite by far is the lowest cost of distribution. And whether it's today in traditional media or in the future, I think that uh, that will still be the case. So we talked about reliability, and it's an infrastructure that's in place today. It doesn't have to be built out. It's, 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 um, it's already in place delivering all that content to all those households we talked about. Next slide. So when I look at the changing landscape and, and um, not getting too caught up in traditional versus new media, but more about how the end user looks at the content, whether um, they're viewing the content in real time or whether it's on demand, whether the content is live or pre-programmed, um, whether it needs to go over a linear or a nonlinear channel. And all those three things play together. And to reduce a little bit of the confusion, if you have a live event, you're going to want to send that real time over a linear system. And that's one of the things that satellite does very well today. And I think that'll continue to do it in the future. Then there's the traditional and alternate distribution techniques, whether it's over the top, web-based video, um, or today over, over the cable networks um, as, as we see most of our mass media. Um, satellite and fiber working together in hybrid networks. I see that's going to continue to take place. Um, you can't get everywhere with fiber, nor can you get everywhere with satellite. So those two will work hand in hand. And uh, premium as well as niche content is going to be a big part of the landscape going forward. And we're going to start to see the transition from digital TV, that existing cable TV infrastructure, migrate into more of an IP delivery, whether it's Doxis over the top or something of that sort. So last slide. So the future, what does it mean for us as a satellite operator? Well, I think there's going to be a lot more programming, a lot more content. One thing I think we're going to see that's going to be very, very interesting is the shift to a single format, 16 by 9. I think standard definition will slowly start to go away, and everything will become HD in, in different resolutions. Uh, we're going to go beyond MPEG-4 into much higher levels of compression. Uh, more efficiency on the satellite from the traditional DVB to DVS2, giving us higher efficiencies, lower cost per bit. And I think another thing we're going to see a lot of is um, the move to even higher definition Ultra HD. And, and I think that's just around the corner as soon as the displays get developed. We're already seeing 3D TV. In fact, if, um, if I can mention, SES has been a big player in the development of some of the best practices for 3D. And if you go to our booth, we can provide you with a demo of how we see 3D evolving and some of the issues that the programmers and the distribution channels will have to overcome to make 3D compelling. Another thing I see in the future is multi-view, multiple camera views, whether it's at a football game, um, soccer matches, um, racing, that sort of thing. And, and then a lot more sports in the niche area, a lot more niche sports and, um, and uh, news and ethnic. And so all of this, as you put it together, means a lot more content, a lot more content and, uh, and the need for a lot more efficiency and hopefully the need for a lot more capacity in the area of satellite. Okay. Well, th thank you, Steve. Our next speaker is uh, Vern uh, Smith. Uh, as I said earlier, he's the Senior Vice President of Business Development at Echostar. So, uh, Steve, uh, Vern? Uh, thank you. Next chart. So what I try to do is to put together a few charts that are more um, provoking questions than anything. Uh, uh, next chart, please. Okay. So this is more of a disclaimer. So my background is satellite. It's IP multicast on satellite. 
So when you what, sort of listen to what I say, take it with a grain of salt that I'm already trying to multicast to the edge, um, say 200 plus channels in MPEG-4 IP format in one of his advanced uh, DVDS2 technology or uh, streams. So what do we do is we deliver via satellite to you know smaller telco and cable operators that can't afford the infrastructure upgrades and also to hotel apartments and universities that have broadband networks but they don't have content on the broadband networks to deliver to either set-top boxes or PCs or iPads or, or whatever. Next slide. So this is just a, a visual of a lot of the programming. Next slide. So part of the question is, um, you know, is the net neutral? And Virgil was asking us some questions to sort of provoke a discussion. And so part of the question is, are the freemium models that are emerging? Um, maybe one of my colleague here will uh, address some of those. But um, you know, and then OTT. A lot of people postulate that OTT is going to kill all subscription models. Um, I think one, one time in the past, I remember when DSL broadband came along, it was going to kill all the other broadband providers. And now I think that basically cable broadband is probably the leader as far as the you know, speed and uh, everything else, except for maybe some fiber. Um, and then the question is, what about mobile? Our, is our mobile subscription is going to be a standalone or an add-on? You know, how, how are we going to evolve into a mobile environment? Are people going to stream in IP to their devices? Uh, what bit rates will they have? What format will it be in? There's a whole number of questions that come out as some of the new models and new formats and new devices uh, you know, come online, so to speak, for IP delivery um, and on whatever the net is defined to be. Um, <clears throat> then you look at the established business models with ISPs. Uh, I think a lot of the, the discussion about net neutrality is not so much about the net, but about the last mile of the delivery mechanism for the net. A lot of the subscription models are based upon linking you to the net. Um, generally, I think on the next slide, I, I was just looking up. So you go ahead. Next slide. So when Virgil was asking, you know, a comment about net neutrality, first I was like, well, let's go to the um, the current, what do you call it, definition at Wikipedia, since that seems to be the, the place to go for all definitions nowadays. And it was sourced by, you want to call it the author of net neutrality or co that coined the word, uh, I think it's Professor Wu. And so basically I was trying to figure out, OK, what is really net neutrality? And then take it from a satellite-centric viewpoint. And a lot of what we try to do from the satellite view is bypass as far into the house as we can with, with the content or with connections. Um, and so, for instance, when we have a, a, a service, you know, like, like Steve was saying, we, we're one of the largest DTA providers, so EchoStar uh, provides all the infrastructure, technology, operations for DISH networks, um, over 14 million subscribers. So there's a lot of infrastructure there delivering, you know, hundreds of thousands of channels basically every day. Um, the question is, is it in the right format in the house on an IP network? Does it have to migrate into a, you want to call it last mile IP network? Um, and that's really when the net neutrality comes in and, you know, if there's any online uh, delivery uh, versus satellite delivery. So part of, the, part of the, the issue with net neutrality, in my view anyway, is, uh, is there competition um, or a competitive offering? For instance, if you have the only 10 megabit per second service in your neighborhood and the price is right, you probably go with that until they start to throttle you on content that you want to watch. And so then as wireless and other technologies and even satellite broadband um, start to progress and get better services, you'll have, a, you'll have options. And so if somebody's starting to throttle you and you're not locked into a two-year contract, you can actually switch. And so people that are actually neutral and provide the entertainment experience that you expect now from the internet, um, you'll be able to switch very easily. And then I think a lot of the issues with net neutrality will sort themselves out just through competition. So, you know, what's changing in the media landscape? Um, I think a lot of the, some, you know, we're very interested in satellite broadband. Um, you know, as you, I think there's been some press releases about uh, 
the EchoStar acquisition of Hughes. So we, we believe in satellite delivered broadband. Um, there's also a terrestrial delivered broadband, but obviously terrestrial costs are very high to deliver it to certain um, communities. So what we look for is some of the uncovered spaces. Also on the, the cable side, you know, cables evolving from mainly just a, a pay TV package uh, and subscriber base that delivers content in markets that cannot receive terrestrial well enough to more of a, I'd say, a broadband pipe. And then satellite, we're evolving from more of a, a direct-to-home uh, broadcaster into basically a hybrid network that has, like, current um, satellite delivery mechanism. You can go direct via satellite to the house with what want to call it the short tail content. You can go via IP network with long tail content. You can stream and cache via the satellite to the hard drive that's, that's in the house or the home media center. There's a number of ways to deliver the content and the experience. And it's really a hybrid, you know, we'll call it wired, satellite, um, linear, nonlinear experience that the consumers are um, demanding now. Thank you. Thank you, Vern. And our final speaker uh, is uh, Charlie Good. He's the co-founder and CTO of uh, Wowza Network Systems, uh, and he'll talk about uh, this issue from the uh, software side. Hello. How, how many of you know who Wowza Media Systems are? Right, raise your hand. Not good. <laughs> Not good. Our marketing guys should be fired. So we are the problem. I mean, we are really the problem about net neutrality because we're enabling lots of long tail content developers to stream content over the internet to different devices. Next slide, please. So what we're going to talk about th today is a quick overview of who we are, which seems to be needed. We're also going to talk a little bit about exactly what we do and how we do it. Uh, also talk a little bit about net neutrality and how it applies to over the top video, as well as the long tail of video and what that means. Uh, one, of the, one of the technologies in this area is adaptive bitrate streaming for delivering the best quality stream to a device or player. We'll talk a little bit about how that's part of the problem and also part of the solution. And then some conclusions which I think lead to very similar questions to my colleagues beside me. Next slide, please. So first, Wowza Media Systems. Visit our booth because you need to know who we are. So we've been in business about five years. We're a media streaming server software company. And our claim to fame is we can deliver content to many different devices, set-top boxes, desktops, mobile. Uh, we deliver content everywhere. Uh, we're a great software company with fanatical support, and that's how we've made our name. We have 70,000 licensees that are running our software kind of in their back end in, in 145 countries. So we have pretty broad reach. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a picture of what we do. We can take in live or video on demand content from many different sources. And then we do all the magical twisting and turning and protocol manipulation that's needed to get out to different devices. Flash on the desktop, Silverlight smooth streaming on the desktop, set top boxes such as Inseo or Amino. We can deliver to, to uh, Android, Blackberry phones, as well as Apple based phones using Apple streaming protocol, as well as other IT, IPTV platforms. Uh, both live and video on demand content. So that's kind of what we do. So as you can see, we're the problem. We, we are all about enabling customers and people to deliver lots of video over the top to lots of different devices. So we're chewing up a lot of bandwidth. <laughs> Next slide. So net neutrality. Uh, so there is a huge interest in our customer base to deliver video to many different devices. And that interest is extremely strong. I mean, what we're seeing is our customers are coming to us every day wanting to get much, much broader reach with their content. What we try to do is make that easy, and what does that do? That chews up a lot of bandwidth on the network. Uh, we're also seeing there are many, many more publishers out there. Traditionally, it was always kind of the, the your TV channels, you know, both public access and the, and the pay-for channels, but we're seeing tons of individual content owners that want to get their word out there, whether it's schools or churches or small clubs or community groups. That they're all getting more adept at grabbing and picking up some of these simple Cisco you know, recording devices, creating high def video and putting it out on the internet. And we really make that simple and, and, uh, and easy to do and easy to get out to all these different devices. So what's interesting is video is really driving this debate in, in a lot of ways because it is so heavy. 
Uh, certainly, net neutrality applies to a lot of other areas, but video is probably the main one that's driving it because of the heaviness of video. So next, please. Next slide. So right now, Netflix is kind of the poster child for this problem. I mean, everyone points back to them as being you know, a huge consumer of bandwidth, and certainly all the stats will tell you that that is true. But we believe that actually over the, the long run, that long tail content, content from a very different uh, number of publishers, are also going to exponentially lead to this problem as well. As you see more and more publishers out there, kids with camcorders, kids with phones, publishing high def video on the internet, you know, at, at an incredible rate, I think they're also going to lead to this problem as well. So one of the scary things about the way net neutrality is being dealt with today is a lot of it is pointing at the big players and we're looking at regulating based on the big players, but I think long tail content uh, should also play a big part in, in how this is controlled and dealt with. Next slide, please. So one of the interesting things that we enable in the player technologies is starting to pick up is this whole idea of adaptive streaming. So what is adaptive streaming? The idea is I can deliver multiple bitrate renditions of my video out to the internet such that the device that's playing back at the stream, the video, will pick the best stream for their situation, both network and playback. So if I'm on an iPhone or an iPod Touch, I may play a very low bitrate stream. If I'm on the desktop or if I'm at home in, behind my TV, I'm gonna, it's going to stream the much higher bitrate version. So what's interesting is this is really leading to the problem because now publishers don't have to make a decision over the bitrate of their video, uh, like kind of a lowest common de denominator type of decision. What they can do is deliver a varying set of bit rates and make that available to the customers and the player will pick the fastest or best one that they can play. So what does this do? This leads to a saturation of the network much, much, much faster. But on the other hand, multi-bit rate also, if the network is saturated, will try to pick the best stream to play based on those network conditions. So it's kind of an interesting fact that it leads to the problem and also causes the problem. Um, one of the things we're doing, and please do stop by our booth, is we're trying to make multi-bit rate easier. So we're trying to, we're adding features into our product to allow you to do, to create those multiple renditions on the fly next to the streaming server so that this multi-bit rate, bit rate delivery to all these different devices can happen seamlessly and simply. Next slide, please. So what are the conclusions from our point of view? It sure seems like the ideals of net neutrality make a lot of sense. I mean, it seems like it should be a fair and open place to, for you to get your content out there. We're not sure that legislation is the answer. Where it's, there's lots of talk whether it will stifle competition, whether it will st stifle uh, technology innovation. Um, and one of the questions I think is whether natural competition will actually lead to the right answer versus regulation. And then one of the interesting problems is, is the problem really getting worse? Yes, there's a lot more video being published on the network and on the internet, but also you know, the bandwidth providers are, are also providing bandwidth at a, at a breakneck pace. You're seeing a lot more services being offered to your home with higher bitrate delivery mechanisms that are far, far beyond what's needed to deliver high definition video to any players in your home. So you, you wonder if it's a, 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 pro, a fleeting problem or not. So that's it. I appreciate you listening. Well, thank you, Charlie. Now for the uh, interactive part of our program. <laughs> the uh, floor is now open for your questions or comments on the uh, presentations that you just heard. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, let me just make one thing very clear since this is a net uh, neutrality uh, session. Uh, please state uh, whether you are for or against uh, net neutrality. <laughs> Starting with uh, Steve. Well, I guess from, uh, from SES's point of view, because we are in the middle sort of the core of the entire network. It, it really doesn't matter to us um, how, how neutral the net is, um, you know, and um, you know, our job is to deliver content out to the edge. And I think as Vern had mentioned, net neutrality is really an edge issue. It's not in the core of the network. And um, so I, I don't think we necessarily have an opinion on it one way or another. Our job is to carry the content, whether, whether, it gets, whether it's the long tail, the short tail content, whether it's premium, whether it's niche, user generated, um, that's our job. Steve? Oh, um, for or against? 
I, I'd say uh, four. Four? Okay, that's one neutral and one four. <laughs> and I'd say I guess you're four. We're four. Right? <laughs> so you're four the ideals, that's absolutely. Well, I mean, conceptually or philosophically, I think it's, it's great, but like it's the devil's in the details. Yeah. Well, it's really a very important issue, and uh, unfortunately, uh, AT and T, Verizon—they're the main proponents of uh, the uh, what is now an issue legislatively. Uh, today, the House uh, passed against the regulations uh, against uh, FCC regulations, and just to summarize it, basically, uh, the FCC wants to uh, differentiate between wireless and uh, and fixed uh, 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 networks. So there's different rules for wireless ones. In the wireless ones, vi uh, uh, voice uh, uh, traffic should s still have priority over uh, video. So that's one of the bones of uh, contentions. And, uh, and I'm glad that you brought it up, Charlie, that, uh, that video is really driving all of this. And uh, uh, so your customers, uh, uh, are they really demanding uh, more and more you know, distribution towards IP? Absolutely. I mean, we're seeing a huge movement towards IP, IP delivery. I mean, our cust and we're seeing I mean, a huge demand in Europe for this, you know, as well as the U.S., and it's picking up in Asia. I mean, I, there, there are a lot more content publishers out there, many, many more. But wouldn't net neutrality uh, uh, discriminate against newer players? Like you, you are from a startup company. Uh, you know, with the more established players, if they get, you know, precedence or a priority over, you know, someone who didn't pay as much or, you know, didn't have as much resources. Well, and I guess that's why I think that it, it, net should be neutral. How about you, Steve? Uh, uh, SES has uh, one of the uh, biggest broadcasters in your neighborhood uh, using your satellites. And I noticed that in your slide you just mentioned digital IP, but the others are pretty much the normal uh, you know, broadcasting services, HD, uh, standard depth, etc. Yeah. Do you see them? Uh, do you see a reluctance on their part to uh, the stream of uh, uh, video uh, on the net because of you know the uh, the problems that they may encounter with rights and all that? You, you mean from the programmers' point from of view? From the programmers' point well, of view. I think uh, you know I look at the programmers. Uh, th their presence on the web is um, is really just an extension of their marketing, so to speak. I mean they're really trying to drive interest and awareness of their individual properties. So you go to cbs.com to the Hawaii Five O subsite. You're there to to get more immersed in that content, and and maybe you'll see some short clips there and that sort of thing. But you're driven to the TV, to the living room, to where you get the full experience from that very high, highly produced premium content. So. Streaming on the web from the programmer's point of view, in my opinion, is necessary to help build the, the, the audience and the awareness. Will um, premium content from the major programmers go to the web? I, I think that's nonsensical. I don't think that makes any, any sense to them because you're not going to watch that content through a browser. That's not how you get the experience. You want to be on the biggest TV you have when you're watching it. Now, certainly, you'll, you'll watch it on a, a smaller device if that's all you have, but you always want to get driven back to where that big display is, where you're going to get the full effect of what that program was trying to do when he developed that content. So, and Bert, you have anything to add to that? Since Equistar is both a satellite operator, it also is a hardware provider. And well, part of it, there's, um, I think part of what net neutrality is is more about your standard unmanaged IP networks. I mean, a lot of what we deliver over our content over is high value content over managed IP networks. So it's really under some people's definition of IPTV. So a lot of it goes, um, what should I say, it gets confused in the whole IPTV general definition. But I think people are going to watch um, the best content and it's going to be delivered via the web. It's just a matter of when, is my view. Um, and then the question is, how do you get it there most efficiently? Do you stream it to the edge on satellite? Do you cache it locally? You know, where is it stored? How is it managed? How is it secured? Yes, 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 please. A uh, question here? Uh, we're, we're videotaping it, so could you uh, wait for this? Could you repeat the, just the question? You, you mentioned uh, it's just a matter of when in regards to the, the programming being distributed 
wireless, for example, or wireless networks. If I understood what you were saying, it's well, correct. What I was what, saying what, my question is, what's that time period, in your opinion? Is it a year from now, three years from now? Because obviously, there, I mean, there's obviously programmers or content creators that are cre trying to create premium content uh, via the internet, dis dis distributed over the internet. When do you see CBS distributing over uh, you know, a network rather than cable because everything's wireless? Um, I, I think it's really a matter of unmanaged versus managed. Right now, there is IP delivery of basically every channel out there. And then the question is, what's that last mile? Uh, what's the management of that? I mean, we, we encrypt it, you know, very securely all the IP content, premium content, regular content, on-demand content. Um, and, you know, basically everything is delivered in IP format now. Part of the, the issue is, is it delivered over an unmanaged IP network where you just pay for access to the, the, the general internet? And even in that environment, um, they're doing IP movies now, uh, pay-per-views. So it's here now. The question is, is it here now for everybody? The answer is no, because it's a lot of it's a matter of how big is and, the pipe. And that's my question. It will, it will never it, be here what, for everybody. It, it just won't be, because if you're in the middle of, um, I, I guess it could be if they want to pay. So <laughs> we can deliver via satellite broadband, and you can stream anything you want, just like the regular internet, um, to a farm in Kansas. But the cost. But you're never going to lay fiber across the 100 miles of, you know, you're not going to trench the ground for, for one guy in the middle of nowhere. Charlie, you'd like uh, to uh, comment on that? You think? Uh, yeah, I mean, we think it's it's coming on very quickly. I mean, now we see a big move to it. In Europe, we're seeing, you know, certainly the, t the TV infrastructure in Europe is much different, and so we see a, a, in there, it's a lot of it's country controlled, and they want to get those stations out everywhere. And so you will see delivery over to TV sets, over the cable infrastructure. You'll see it over wireless to handheld devices, and all of that's happening now. All the infrastructure is already there. Well, that's, that's that's not entirely true. So it's no. all about scalability. And as I mentioned, you know, when you look at getting real mass market. Now, mass market is you want one piece of content to go to 60 million households at the same time, and it's high bandwidth content. So you want to watch it on your TV. It's the Super Bowl, whatever the case is. Then you need something that has that level of scale. And the internet, I think, is going to be very effective for the long tail content. When that long tail content goes from niche to premium because it starts to develop the viewership, what are the program, the programmers going to want to do, or the content developers? They're going to want it to get it on the highest quality distribution channel, managed distribution channel, as Vern says, as, as they can. And then they can afford to pay for it because now they got the eyeballs, they got the ad revenue, and all that sort of thing. And so it's, it's not one or the other, it's both together. And as Charlie said, it's really being able to deliver it to all those platforms and let the user decide. But the, the TV is not going away in the home because we're all, you know, we're all buying all these you know, HD TVs, Ultra HD, that's not going away. But what we want to do is be able to have that experience on any device wherever we are, right? The, the use of, the use of you're, you're, or watching um, programming from the internet on your television, you've been able to do that for years. If you know which, if you know how to set it up, do you think there's a time limit where that'll become uh, a universal? Uh, where people, everyone, in the, you know, will have their TV, their big screen TV, hooked up to programming on the internet, so they can watch their Netflix or whatever other programming, niche programming, specialty wrestling, sports programs, or whatever, on their big screen. When do you think that time limit or that timetable will be? Say well, but what, what market penetration are you getting to to answer the question? I mean, that if you get to 25%, 50%, 100, you'll never get to 100% because some people don't want an internet connected device. It's kind of a difficult question because, as you know, the uh, market is always changing, demands are always changing, it's always evolving, you know. Uh, I, uh, I've uh, resisted actually getting a cell phone for a long time, and then I, when the iPhones came out, I'm still, I still don't have a, an iPhone. I'm still waiting for that Dick Tracy where I can do everything on my wrist. But uh, if, if we all take that uh, position and wait until you know things, so everything fall into place, I don't think uh, we'll go anywhere. Don't you think? <laughs>
think that, that, <laughs> that's true. I think you're right. Yeah. So is there any other questions from the floor? Yes, sir. Uh, there's a mic here, please, because we're taping it. State uh, your name and company, please. So we know where we can find you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, I work for Foxtel in Australia. Mm. I'm just wondering what you think should be done about piracy over the net. Yeah, piracy. That's a very important issue. Thanks for ra raising that. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it, we, we, we're, we, we are adding features to our product to try to protect against piracy. So it's anything from DRM to simple token-based protection. You know, what we're trying to do is, is provide cost-effective solutions so that the, the little guy that wants to do simple protection and not pay for the DRM type management can, all the way up to full-blown play-ready Microsoft DRM, you know, all the way to watermarking videos. I mean, protection is incredibly important. Content owners should feel like their content is getting to where they want it to be and nowhere else. So it is extremely important. And we, personally, we take it very, very seriously. Vern, you must have something to say about the piracy in your system. We, we want to stomp out piracy. I mean, you, you need to, if you have content you want to monetize, uh, you need to be able to, you know, have your business models work, either it premium or not. I mean, you, sh you need to be able to monetize it. So, we're, I mean, we're obviously against piracy. Yeah, thanks for raising that point. Well, he's from Australia, right? Uh, yeah, it's a very big problem in the Asia Pacific, and uh, it drains a lot of revenue. I think the last year, the uh, the statistics from the Cable Satellite Association of Asia and the Pacific has uh, estimated $2 billion worth of uh, drainage of uh, revenue right, from piracy. So kind of piracy that's the dark side of the net neutrality thing. You know, we want to keep the net open, but you know, when you open the windows, you get in the flies as well. So there has to be built-in systems. Well, the, to, net, the to net's not the problem. The net neutrality is not the problem with piracy, it's the pirates. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure what kind of piracy you're talking about, whether it's streaming live TV shows that people think that they're... They're really talking about BitTorrents. Oh, oh. BitTorrents. Yeah. It's a big problem in Australia. Um, I guess in Australia we get a lot of content that's, that's behind what gets broadcast in the States. So people want that content when it's available, so right. they, they pirate it. So that then, I mean, as you know, some of the windows are being compressed. So, I mean, my general view is have global releases. Like one of the projects we're working on is basically digital cinema delivery. So everything's becoming digitized. It's, uh, it's very secure. So you don't have people filming in theaters and then taking that file and then sending it to a country that has maybe a later release window than the US. And that's where a lot of the piracy comes in. If you do a simultaneous global release in digital, just beam it everywhere via satellite, of course, um, then you know you eliminate some of that, that value in the piracy. Right. Any other questions from the floor? Comments? So uh, let's get back to uh, the satellite uh, uh, business. Uh, it seems like you know uh, it's obvious that uh, the consumer demands are changing, and uh, so are the uh, content providers are also trying to adapt to that. Uh, and then there are many different um, delivery mechanisms. Multi-screen is now the uh, kind of a catchphrase. What's the future for satellite, uh, Steve? Uh, can you still do the old, play, <laughs> they used to call it plain old telephony, now plain old satellite service, just uplink, downlink? Uh, or as, as Vern uh, alluded to in his presentation, the more a hybrid network where everybody has a, you know, a role or play to role in that. So how do you see the future in the, the well, satellite? Well, certainly I think, um, the, the use of fiber along with satellite will continue to evolve. Um, one thing that uh, fiber does is it gives you global reach. So a programmer can get to virtually any market in the world via fiber, then when he gets in market, so he went from one point to a few points, and then now you go from a few point to a million or hundreds of millions of points via satellite. So it really comes down to satellite's longevity will be based on the efficiency that it provides in, in multicast or broadcast, and, and I don't see that going away um, at all. Um, and I think one of the, one of the things that a lot of us do in the industry is we we sort of confuse um, like on demand versus live with linear and nonlinear and, and all that sort of thing. Um, satellite is a linear channel, as we all know, but so is fiber. It's a linear channel. Um, it's what makes it on demand is where you place your storage in the value chain. Is the storage gonna be at the source 
or is the storage going to be at the end or somewhere in the network itself? DVR is storage at the end, okay? So a linear channel is driving all of that content to be stored locally. Um, if it's stored at the source, which is something that you start to see with web-based video, that makes sense because it's a few viewers. It's that long tail content. But as soon as the content starts to get a lot of viewership, you start to push it out. And in content delivery networks, that's exactly what you do. Is as the, the content gets much, much, much more heavy, and you're trying to hit more and more destinations, you put it deeper into the network. And so I look at it as satellite is here. There's no question about it. And it's a combination of satellite uh, fiber and where the storage uh, occurs. One thing that a lot of people probably don't know is that uh, most, if not all, of the video on demand that you get through your cable system was fed via satellite to the server at the, uh, at, at the cable head or within the cable system. Almost all, if not all of it. And the reason why? It's the most efficient way to get that one piece of content out to 6,000 head ends just like that, get it stored. It's, it's a very simple approach, it's very bulletproof, and, and by the way, it's very secure. Well, Bern, I have to ask you, you know, as you know, Equistar has been in the news lately. They've been uh, quite a buying spree. Equistar is led by Charlie Ergen, one of the most visionary uh, uh, figures in this industry. And uh, they bought DBCSD, the uh, mobile operator, the former ICO constellation. DBSD. DBSD. So that was Dish. So that's mobile. Uh, Dish Network. Yeah, Dish, well, Equistar Separate. group. Yes. <laughs> They, you, they bought use uh, network systems, the operator of the uh, Spaceway uh, broadband uh, uh, satellite uh, service, which will have a high throughput satellite coming up called Jupiter. What else did you buy? You bought Blockbuster, so you're going to... Uh, SDS. <laughs> yeah, SDS. Uh, Move Networks. Adaptive Move streaming. networks for adaptive streaming, competing with uh, Charlie's. Uh, Sling Media. Yeah, so you uh, have your hands in all these uh, different, uh, you know, areas. You just pretty much covered it. So, um, tell, t tell us your vision of how your company is going to evolve and how the you know the market is going to change as a result. Well, I think it's probably outlined in the slides. I mean, it's it's hybrid. I mean, right now. When you um, go for a Dish Network subscription, the box has a, an up to a one terabyte hard drive to cache, if you want to call it, content that is pitched via satellite or it can be pulled via the internet. It's hooked to the internet so you can actually do IP VOD content. So it's really a hybrid network. And I think like Steve said was, you know, satellites uniquely positioned to deliver one piece of content to, in a multicast mode to millions of people simultaneously. If you look at doing all that bandwidth unicast, the cost is enormous on a CDN. So, you know, look at the events like Super Bowl at six to ten megabits or eighteen megabits per second in unicast mode. Forget about it on a CDN. I mean, it's just not going to happen. So, you need still that huge pipe in the sky. Mm -hmm. So, I think actually, if anything, satellite looks better than ever to sort of deliver those that one call it the, the heavy content. Right. Charlie, what's your take on the future of the media? You know, you have an interesting background too. He used to work for Adobe, so you work. In, uh, where do you see it uh, going? You see, they come from the satellite field manufacturers. They used to work for. They build satellites. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think agree. I agree, completely agree. It's going to be a hybrid model. I think you're going to see mm -hmm. satellite delivery for your kind of one-to-many broadcast content, high-value content that you watch in your living room. And then I think next to that, there'll be a Roku box or a Western Digital box to right. deliver your over-the-top type video. I do think that that video is going to go in some ways, a lot of the ways that MP3 or music has gone, where I remember when CDs first came out and the, the, uh, the audio files said the quality wasn't good enough, right? And then all of a sudden, the, the kids came in and said, well, I can only fit 14 songs in that little disc. I want to put a thousand, right? And then it all went to MP3s, and now we're in a world where it's MP3s. I think video is going to go in a similar way, where some of that premium content will be viewed on smaller screens. It's portable, it's smaller, it's easier to deal with. The quality is good enough. Some of it you want to be immersed in it, and others stuff you don't need to be. So I think it is going to be a hybrid model for both the premium and the free content. So I think that's three uh, votes for a uh, hybrid uh, model. So, but what what the uh, what will predominate that, or what will dominate that hybrid model? Or will satellite play a lesser role? Will there be more IP uh, traffic, or more? How about the terrestrial? Well, um, when we talk about IP, 
eventually everything's going to be IP. There, there, I think there's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But don't equate IP to internet. That that's not IP. Right. Okay. Um, in fact, there's some cable operators. They send their video on demand content via IP over their private network. It never hits the internet. So um, I think it just makes sense for things to eventually be all IP. You look at the existing uh, cable TV infrastructure, you've got two different systems sitting side by side. You've got the legacy system, which is a digital TV, six megahertz, 256 QAM system, and sitting next to it is an IP-based network. It's also sitting in a lot of the same infrastructure, but they're side by side. Um, and why does the digital TV infrastructure still sit there? Because there's billions of dollars of set-top boxes sitting out there. You don't just forklift that out and drop in another billion dollars to put in because there's no reason to. It works. But over time, I think it will be all IP, whether it's a private network or a public network, whether it's over that last mile or the internet, it will um, be all MPEG-4. Today we have a lot mm -hmm. of MPEG-2. It's going to eventually be all MPEG-4. Why isn't it MPEG-4 today? The same reason. There's billions of dollars of investment out there that you just can't turn over overnight. Um, and I also believe that it'll be, as we said before, a hybrid network where the long tail will be more predominantly over a, more of a unicast network, and the, the short tail is going to be over something that's much more, more effective. But I think it'll be all IP. I don't, I don't think there's a question about that, because IP provides levels of flexibility that you can't get into the other proprietary technologies. Right. So any other questions from the audience, comments, reactions? Yeah, Mon monetization. Same we, it's the same subscription modeling. In terms of the U.S., I mean. We see it all. Like I mean, and I think there, it depends on what type of content you have as to what's the right way to mo what's the right model to monetize it. But I don't know if I see a consolidation in any particular model. I think I think there's a lot of content owners that are struggling trying to figure out how to monetize, right? And then I think they're trying to figure out what model fits them. But I don't. We have not seen consolidation in that area. Now, Charlie, from the clients that you serve, uh, how successful are they in, in repurposing and monetizing their content? Uh, I mean, I think a lot of it is advertising based, mm -hmm. right? And I think there's some success there. I think video ads have a, a higher kind of click through, pay for uh, model. And so I, so I think that helps. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure I really know how to exactly answer that. Yeah, because yeah, I think uh, that's one of the reluctance for the more established broadcasters. Uh, don't you think, uh, Steve, uh, you know, that they're taking a longer time in, uh, in migrating to uh, streaming media because, you know, well, of course, there's that issue of uh, rights and, uh, and piracy, but also the question of how do you monetize it? How can you uh, manage and, uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, collect, you know, everything that you're, that's due to, to, to you. I just want to, just want to, what you're seeing then is more uh, consistent monetization within the advertising model. Seems to be, right. yeah. Just in your, in your experience in your market. Yeah, a lot of it feeds back to a smaller number of ad networks that people are leveraging to put ads on their sites. Yeah, Steve, you want to say? Well, I think it's, it's sort of stating the obvious that you have to have a viable business model and what you see today is a lot of new distribution, you know, some of the over-to-the-top plays coming out that, you know, if you really put all the carriage costs in there, all the elements that they would need to really build a viable model, it's not there because someone's going to have to pay for over-to-the-top delivery. The, the, uh, the, cable, um, the, the, the cable broadcaster um, or the telco isn't going to give away their broadband access for free. I mean, they've got billions invested in that, so that's not going to happen. So if you look at a Hulu or a Netflix or the other over-the-top play, is that at some point, they're going to have to pay for the carriage. They're going to have to because otherwise, if everything went that way, the cable operators would say, I can't make money, and they would cease to exist. So it's, to me, it's kind of obvious that today we're seeing the pioneers out there, and some of those pioneers are going to take the, the arrows in the back, you know, because you know, they're doing new things, and they're creating new technologies that are allowing the users, the consumers, to develop new behaviors, and those new behaviors are then driving new technologies again. And, but at the end of the day, I think it's going to all settle out. And, and I think the players that you're going to see in the future may not necessarily be all that different than the players you see today. Right. Well, well put. So Steve, uh, does anyone have to, anything else to add? Because uh, we're, we're actually, uh, unfortunately, at the end of this, uh, our time. Uh, 
And uh, would you like to add anything else? Any final thoughts, Vern or Charlie? Stop by and see our booth. <laughs> you obviously don't know who we are. And, yeah. <laughs> That's why it's we're advertising driven. <laughs> I think we're, on that I, note, we're very you know, ad driven. Yeah, yeah uh, I think uh, we ended on a good note that, that monetization, that, you know, at the end of the day, this is a business. And uh, I think more than anything, that's uh, what's going to drive uh, uh, this, this uh, you know, all these uh, discussions about uh, the, the role and the future of uh, the net and, and all the other delivery mechanisms. So uh, thank you for, for all, all of my panelists here uh, and for all of you for uh, staying with us. Thank you.